Lisa DeLong is a registered nurse, author, bereavement facilitator, nationally known speaker, and advocate for the needs of patients and their families. Lisa's firstborn son died at the age of 15 when he relapsed after a 10-year remission from leukemia. Six years later, her youngest son was also diagnosed with the same kind of leukemia. He has completed treatments and is now a healthy teenager. Lisa also has two courageous daughters who were bookended by their brothers. As a nurse, Lisa has truly experienced life on both sides of the curtain, that of patient and caregiver. Please welcome Lisa DeLong. I can't tell you what a joy it is to be here today and just to see your faces. Because when I look, look out at you, I see the energy of life. I see spirit. And when I think of spirit, I think of that energetic life flow that animates our bodies, what the Greek called pneuma, or breath of life. And when I think about life, I think about the calling that came to each one of us to be involved in healthcare. For me, that calling, uh, the earliest recollection I have of that calling is when I was about eight years old and my family went fishing. And uh, this was, I live in California, this was the Kern River when they actually had water in our rivers <laughs> in California. And my brother had caught a little fish and he put it in a bucket. And after a while that fish started to float and it bothered me and I showed my mom. And she said, well, take the little fish with your hands and get back in the water and, and push the fish back and forth, back and forth, and that will force oxygen over its gills. And maybe, just maybe, it will live. And I did that. I got the little fish and I got into the water and it was uncomfortable and cold and I was kind of scared actually to try it. And I, I pushed the little fish back and forth and back and forth and pretty soon that little fish tensed up and it swam off into the current. And I was thrilled. I stood there just like, wow, I saved a life. How awesome is that? And that same feeling is what ultimately led me to nursing school. I graduated from LA County USC Medical Center School of Nursing in 1983. Any of you have a cap like this? Anybody? Step? Yes, we still have a few. It's a very rare, no more caps these days. But in those days, I used to love to go up on top of the roof of the nursing dorms and look out all over Los Angeles and wonder who my next patient would be. But never in my wildest imagination did I think I would need my nursing skills more for my own children than for strangers. I married my high school sweetheart, and we had a family. <laughs> Lots of personalities. <laughs> and I'm so, I'm so happy to announce that the little girl in this zippered sweatshirt, or the red zippered jacket, is, just graduated from college last week. And she flew in this morning, and she's sitting right there. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's JoJo. And JoJo's lived through this, so this is especially tender sharing today. Justin, her big brother, was diagnosed with leukemia when he was five years old. He did well and was in remission for almost 10 years. Just a couple of weeks after this photo was taken, it was discovered that his leukemia was back, and it was back with a vengeance. And Justin died very suddenly five months later. The night before he died, I sat by his bed in the ICU and I had a dream. I dreamt that Justin was being resuscitated and that I stood at the edge of his door yelling, let him go, three times. And about 12 hours later, my husband and I sat in a room next to him praying and we heard them call a code blue. And I ran to the door and I still remember that steel cold frame as my hand stood there, I stood there holding myself and I yelled three times, let him go. In the weeks and months and years that followed, I had to do a lot of quiet internal work. And I'm, I'm grateful that I learned what I learned to pay attention to that inner spirit, that inner energy. Because six years after Justin's passing, the baby in this picture, Jacob, was also diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Five months into his treatment, he developed a condition called VOD, veno obstructive disease. When his oncologist pulled us into the conference room and said, you need to prepare yourselves. If Jacob doesn't start urinating in the next 24 hours, he is not likely to survive. And I remember leaving that conference room just angry. 
And I walked to the end of this long hallway at Children's Hospital Los Angeles where there was a floor to ceiling window and I looked out over Sunset Boulevard and I could see the Hollywood sign and I could see people bustling back and forth and I thought, what the hell am I doing in here again? This cannot be happening to me again. And I raised my fist to God and I said, quit picking on my boys. And in that moment, I felt a sense of peace pour over me from the top of my head to the bottom of my soles. And I knew that Jacob would live. I went back in his room. Nothing had changed. And in the wee hours of the morning, Jacob whispered, Papa, I have to pee pee. <laughs> and let me tell you, the sound of warm liquid on plastic was the sweetest sound any parent could ever hear. And the next morning when his medical team came in and said they thought the x-ray they saw that morning was mismarked because all of the fluid that threatened Jacob's life was gone. And he went home in 48 hours. And I'm so grateful to be able to share with you that Jacob hit his five years off chemo mark in October, and JoJo and I get to go home to him on Saturday. <laughs> Thank you. So we got our miracle. We got our miracle. But that miracle was manifested through people like you who show up to work every day, who use your hands, your energy, and bring your energetic life flow to keep people alive and give them the best shot they can. You know, um, each of us has a unique fingerprint. I know this because when I went to renew my nursing license several years ago, I went to um, a live scan and the sheriff said, oh, you have good fingerprints for a nurse. And I was like, what do you mean for a nurse? What is that? You know, I mean, I'll take a compliment of any kind, but that's a little weird. And he said, well, nurses were coming in when we first got this machine and we thought it was broken because it wasn't picking it up. And they started to see a pattern. Other professions, it worked. Nurses, it didn't. And, in, and that we all leave a little bit of ourselves wherever we go. And when you meet a patient, whether it's opening a door or pounding a keyboard or, or signing a check or physically touching another human being, you bring a little bit of your spirit, a little bit of your unique identity wherever you go. You know, Dave and I have sat on parent panels for end-of-life care, my husband and I, who've had that privilege. And at one of these um, parent panels that we are at, uh, there was a dad to my left. His name is Steve, firefighter, big dude. And he conveyed this story. His little baby had been in the NICU for many months, little preemie. And when she died, it was very devastating. And he used to go back to her um, medical care center to see if he could just hang out with, maybe see some of her, her uh, caregivers. And I can relate to that, because I have such a strong, <laughs> intense relationship with mine. And um, so he walked into the cafeteria, and he saw one of the nurses, and it surprised him, and he ran up to her, and he knocked her over, and uh, knocked over her mac and cheese, and she, she was shocked, and, and there was this moment of chaos, and he looked at her hands, and he said, these are the hands that held Olivia. That's how we see you. This is how we see you. So indulge me for a moment, please, and just open your hands. Just look at your hands, and think of all the mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and daughters and sons that you have shared your unique fingerprint with. And on behalf of every one of those human beings, it is my great privilege and honor to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you don't hear it enough. I know you don't, because I've been on both sides of this. You do not hear it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, we don't know where our spirit will take us. But when I look out at you, I see more good than you can imagine, because I know you are the spirit of healthcare. And it is getting better. And things like Justin not having anesthesia when he first had his very first bone marrow aspiration. He had no anesthesia. That would be unheard of today. We don't know where our calling will take us. Flying in from LA Monday, I sat next to a woman five hours on a plane. We said nothing to each other. Landed, got in early. Pilot says, we're going to be on the tarmac for about 10 minutes because we're early. We take off our headphones, we start talking. She says, this is my, my first trip to DC without my husband, he died a year and a half ago. And she's taking care of the grandkids. So I gave her my condolences, said I, I can relate, my son died. She said, my son died. I said, oh really? She said, 16 years ago for me, it's been 15 years. She says, you ain't sarcoma, I say leukemia. She says, city of hope. Justin died at city of hope. She says, my son, there's a, a bench, a memorial bench with his name on it under an oak tree at City of Hope. I have sat on that bench with her son's name on it. What are the odds <laughs> of being on a plane 
in total silence and not, even, not knowing that I'm next to another mother who's a nurse whose son has died and we had this incredible experience. That's 10 minutes that counts. Thank you.